My name is Ben Wyland. I am a filmmaker and surfer. Those are two things I'm really passionate about. And 10 years ago, I never would have imagined the path that those two things would lead me on. In 2009, I just graduated from college. And in my free time, I really just enjoyed looking around on Google Earth, looking for waves in really cold, remote places. And there wasn't really any point to it. It was just, you know, out of curiosity. I showed it to my roommate eventually. And when he saw it, he thought maybe I should make a blog about it. You know, I thought it's kind of a cool idea. Maybe I'll give it a try. Why not? You know, first I was just posting weather cams where I'd find footage in remote places where you could see waves breaking in the background or geological research, weather data, and try to put it all together. And then whatever I found, I'd post it. So yeah, I was doing that for a while. And then one day I got an email from Surfer Magazine staff photographer, Chris Burkhard. Said he'd seen the blog and was interested in the places that I was writing about. And he wanted to see if I wanted to go to some of these places that are way off the map, super cold and remote, places that surfers normally don't go to. So that's how it all started. I just can't believe life functions up here. Like, people live up here. I feel like we're on a moonscape. some waves and we didn't find too much and the roads are closed to get to this one area so we're gonna take a snowmobile we're gonna take like five of them and get to this one zone and we think we don't know we think there's gonna be a good wave over there <laughs> look off into the distance and all you see is snow and hills and that's where we're going, backcountry surfing. Probably the biggest challenge with searching for waves in these destinations is just getting to the spot. It's almost like you have to take a helicopter to some of these spots to actually, you know, check the surf or get dropped off and surf. You're really rolling the dice, you know, you don't know if you're gonna even get to surf sometimes. In those areas, I mean, some of those roads go for hours on end without hitting a little town. And it's, I mean, you could literally run out of gas and freeze to death. Twenty, thirty years ago, guys couldn't even surf conditions like this because the wetsuits weren't good enough. So it's opened up a lot of coastline in the far north and south. I mean, at this stage, I, I have no interest in going to a crowded break or lineup. And although it's cold, I don't mind it because there's usually no one in sight.
I don't know if I ever imagined myself surfing and being deep in the snow and paddling out and getting pretty darn amazing waves like that. That idea of there still can be a perfect unsurfed wave out there. The only thing is, is chances are you're definitely going to have to go into the cold climates to find that. It's kind of nice to know that there's a lot more out there still to explore. It's a challenge. It's definitely no easy feat to go to the Pharaohs and score. People were genuinely perplexed and just baffled. going to these tiny, tiny little places where the population was like 15. And you're looking in the bay that they look at every single day, but we were looking for waves. And, you know, the way that they see the ocean compared to what we're seeing the ocean as is a different experience. It's so killer though, it's such a small little space. Yeah, perfect river mouth going out. Probably a nice little right wedge up there in the corner. Yeah, I mean, essentially the Faroe Islands are just hundreds of islands just clustered in between Iceland and Norway. So you have, you know, aspects from each of those kind of cultures that exist in one little tightly packed island chain. You're pretty much just driving around on the ferries, on the boats, getting helicopter flights. That's the way you get around from island to island. We were getting skunked for, you know, 10 straight days, 12 straight days. It felt like forever just sitting in the rain, the wind, and um, driving around every corner and not finding anything that resembled a surfable wave. We ended up one day just driving through town and we saw this guy with a blowtorch. We're like, well, that looks kind of crazy. So. We popped our heads in and he was just burning all the hair off these, you know, about 25 sheep's heads. Take the hat and burn all the hair from it. And then they eat it, like all of it, the ice and everything. At the end of the trip, there was a swell forecasted to come in, so we changed our tickets to push it out a couple more days. And like, I don't know, that feeling like when you've gotten skunked for 12 days and there's this swell looming in the forecast that could have waves. I don't know, the conditions are just all over the place, so probably just gonna drive around the island and see what we can find. <laughs>
you're out there in the lineup all alone and the wind is tearing at your face and the way the cold water moves, it just feels a bit thicker and heavier and you're challenging yourself to like some primal level, that feeling, it can't be replicated in my world. You know, your biggest, deepest hopes are finding like an epic wave. One of those rare ones that you know you're gonna come back to, you know, probably for the rest of your life. Man, it is cold outside. That's <laughs> mindless. Maybe in the last eight years we've been exploring the coastline a little bit more and going to all these different places. Somewhere, I feel like we drove around through some... There was this area that my friend had gone to on some work trip and he saw some pretty amazing lefts. That's kind of what we wanted to check out. Yeah. And what you said, there was like a little rock off the corner there. Yeah. And it was in between and... Yeah. It's always like when you go to an area and you see potential, it, it takes, in some cases it's taken us like two, three years focusing on one area just to like completely discover it, but you never really completely discover it because you know, it's, it's the weather changes so fast here. The swells come in super quickly and they don't stay for a long time. expectations, you have whatever and you wanna, you know, get good waves. The thing is like, you know nothing, it's a completely blank. It's like, I mean, there's like, yeah, you can what, see what's it. like solid well. You wanna make the most of it. You wanna be able to look at as many spots as you can while the swell is in the area and you know, if the wind might good, but you don't find always what you think is gonna be there, but then you might up finding something completely different. Yeah, that's that looks like what they And it's basically like a big emotional roller coaster.
After those first few trips, I was really surprised at how different everything was compared to what I'd been looking at online and on the maps. What looked like flat, even terrain would turn out to be a cliff, or what looked like a short walk to the coast would turn out to be an expedition over a mountain pass. But even in spite of all that, seeing the potential kept me optimistic. And I knew that the next trip was gonna be a lot more difficult, a lot more challenging. And I knew that I was gonna take a lot more planning to pull it off. There's a lot of places in the world you wouldn't think to plan a surf trip. And Kamchatka is one of those places. A volcanic peninsula in Russia's far east, just north of Japan. When you know so little about a place, planning a surf trip to get there presents a whole lot of challenges. The lead up to this trip involved a lot of speculation fuzzy phone calls to Russia, and even a call to Israel to get in touch with Tom Curran, who had surfed the region many years ago. It's not the ideal situation for a surf destination. But while Google Earth fed our curiosity, it did little to calm our doubts about finding rideable surf. After months of preparation and years of planning, we headed out. When we arrived, a woman named Martha Madsen picked us up in a military vehicle. Martha mostly helps with journalistic and scientific assignments that access the most wild parts of the peninsula. Her husband was a man of few words, but it was apparent that he could handle himself in the Russian wild. Well, in Kamchatka pushes up from the south, generated by storms that pass Japan. By the time they reach Russia, most of the energy has dissipated. Other swells, such as wind swell from the north and east, are more localized and bring ice cold water. In late summer, the water can be in the low 40s, while the temperature on the beach can reach the 80s. If it's a weekend, days like this draw a crowd. Back in the city, Martha made arrangements to drop us off at the wave we'd seen on the satellite map. We got in the truck, loaded up the whole campsite, and headed into the volcano wilderness to a secluded bay. We found an ideal spot to camp, and we were ready to be out there for 14 days. No showers, no toilets, but we each had our own tents. We set up a base camp at the mouth of a river that fed sand into the ocean. 
across from a small rock island. The river mouths here aren't just focal points for surfers looking for waves. Coming into September, the salmon run is at the tail end of its season. There's so much traffic that the river mouths can get backed up with fish. We covered a lot of ground, but wanted to check out what the remote bay we'd seen on Google Earth could have in store. Yeah. Kamchatka is part of the Ring of Fire and is home to 29 active volcanoes. During the Cold War, the Soviets closed it off and turned it into a top secret military base, closed to foreigners and even most Russians. It was strategically located on Russia's remote eastern front across from the United States and harbored their Pacific fleet of nuclear submarines. Today, many areas of the peninsula are still restricted military zones, making coastal access impossible. When the spot came into view, we instantly recognized it. The bay seemed to have the right set up for a perfect wave. It definitely is kind of protected. I mean, there's two big headlands right outside of it. The wave was so small, it was unrideable. All but the largest sets broke on dry sand. I'm gonna be all right. I've been caught in time. I want you to know that I love you so. It was hard not to wonder what this wave would be like on the right day. And it wouldn't be easy to come back and check it again. My friend, the skies are bright. I see orange light. I want you to know that I Everything here feels so ancient. Boulders and rocks and stone. All the temporary things have just been blown away. The people were just different. The culture was so rich. You know, driving into the older country, there's just not a whole lot. But it's just absolutely beautiful. and it puts time into perspective in a lot of ways. Looking back at the coast and it's just has this ominous, eerie feel, but then, like I said, the sun will pop out and it's just so inviting and friendly and beautiful and uh, it's just crazy.
perfectly poured Guinnesses, hot whiskeys with clove and lemon. It's sitting by the warm fire when you're done freezing your butt off after surfing perfect waves in a pub with older salty local dudes staring you down and you got a shit-eating grin on your face. <laughs> places usually have less surfers. Never really thought they'd be somewhere I'd be focused on going. It's thick wetsuits, it's cold wind and rain, and then you go to these places and realize there's good waves and that there's other surfers there that have already been doing it for years. So we were about a week into the trip and the surf hadn't gone our way. And of course the biggest swell of the year was heading to Hawaii and a mail plane was coming in. And I remember talking to Burkhardt going, man, I think I'm gonna get on that plane and surf the first pipeline swell. And Burkhardt's like, what? That's the worst decision you could ever make. You know, Hawaii is gonna have another pipeline swell, but when are you gonna be here? This may never happen again. Like, look where we are.
who wouldn't want to go surf in Alaska? This sounds rad. And my expectations were honestly as low as they've ever been. I just didn't believe that there would be some crazy barrel setups. That was not in the back of my mind whatsoever. You know, when you're on day 10 and you've been on your quad for four hours, seeing no surf, pop your tire on an antler, that's a bummer. I was sitting in the cab and just kind of mentally exhausted. I could have left, I could have gone to Hawaii and been with hundreds of other surfers doing what everybody does every year. But the next day, Pete came back and goes, dude, Alex, there's a wave that looks like a slab. That moment of staying changed my life. the Aleutian Islands have become the most exotic surf trip I've ever been to. I think that's one of the most rewarding sessions I've ever had in my life and it's the most monumental thing that I've done with surfing. It now encourages me and motivates me to go somewhere else. Years ago, I was just looking at these places on a computer. But now that I've gone and seen them in person, and I've experienced them with my friends, it turned out to be way better than I could have ever imagined. 